Hello. Um, I'm Jeffrey Builder. I realized uh, just a few well minutes ago that this is the first time that I've given a public talk in about six years. And in fact, I'm so unused to speaking to people who are not on Zoom. I'm kind of freaked out that you don't have like funny backgrounds or anything like that going on. It's a, uh, it's a little, uh, it's a little intimidating being here. Um, one of the side effects, of course, of my not having presented in, uh, in person in six years is that um, I forget simple things like the fact that there might be lots of people who are new uh, to the discussion about open scholarly infrastructure. And my uh, two of my colleagues pointed out that earlier in the um, in the sessions today, people asked like how many people are first time attendees of um, of Force Eleven, and there are quite a few. And so. I'd originally planned on just launching into a background story. Um, and then I realized that there may be people looking at this title and going, what the hell is this? And what is he referring to? The principles of FOPEN scholarly infrastructure is a reference to the principles of open scholarly infrastructure, a blog post that I was involved in writing, and then also a website, which is titled uh, the Principles of Open Scholarly Infrastructure, um, which is a distillation of some of the principles that appeared in that blog post. I'm going to explain a lot more about these, but in case you were wondering what the title is about, that's what it's about. And now what I'm going to do is launch into my story. Once upon a time, it was 2004, a long time ago. And at the time I was working for a company called Ingenta, I was their CTO. And I'd been invited to uh, give a talk at an STM Innovations Conference, which um, was sort of seemed very paradoxical to, paradoxical to me at the time. Um, and I was really grumpy. I mean, grumpier than usual. And, um, and the reason that I was grumpy was that we'd been invited to give this talk. And the topic here was the future of primary publishing will, will um, you know, will navigational services win the day? And um, there were a few things here. I was a CTO. I didn't normally give talks. I would have been asked by our executive director to stand in for him for this thing. So I was grumpy about that. But I was particularly grumpy because, um, because the entire world had changed between the time that I'd sent to my slides in advance and the time that I gave my talk. And the funny thing about that talk, when I think about it historically, is that the other person who was speaking that day was Ed Pence, the director of Crossref. And he was pretty grumpy too. And if you know Ed Pence, that's kind of unusual. He's a pretty unflappable guy but he was clearly flapped that day. And, and at the time, I didn't really know why, um, but I came to find out much later. I interpreted his being flapped because something had happened, as I said, that had changed our slides between the time we'd submitted them to STM and the time that we gave our talk. And what we saw as we were standing there waiting to present was that everybody had at that time, it was a tradition to print out the slides ahead of time and put them on the chairs of everybody, right? And this was done at the time and we could see everybody flipping through the paper, right? Which was not the slides we were about to present so that they could prepare their more of a comment than a question. And, you know, while we were talking um, and we knew that like everything that they were looking at was wrong. So I interpreted that as, as being the thing. But the two things that had happened that had made us change our, 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 uh, our slides uh, was that uh, first, on November 10th, Scopus had been announced. And then a mere 10 days later, Google Scholar had been announced. So literally everything that we were going to say about aggregations and navigational services was just up in the air. And for me, that was, you know, that was OK. As I said later on, I came to find out that for Crossref, this was quite a different thing. So let's fast forward to 2007. This is three years later. And I was hired at Crossref to be their director of strategic initiatives, which roughly translates as new shit, right? And 
when I joined Crossref, one of the first things that they did was brief me on some of the things that they'd previously tried to do. And one of the things that they talked about helped to explain to me why Ed was so flapped way back in 2004. The subject of Ed's talk, if you'll see, was Google and science, a common future. And what I didn't know at the time was that what he had planned to do at that talk was announce something called Crossref Search. This was an effort to create a full text index of all of our members of all of the Crossref members' content and present a search interface for it. And what had happened is that they'd been working with a company, Google, on developing this concept of Crossref Search. And so what had happened was that one, a member of Crossref had worked with the other members of Crossref behind the scenes to develop a competing service. And then also Google had worked with those same members to develop a second service behind the scenes, completely unknown, I think completely unknown to Ed at the time. So Crossref search was basically dead. He could not announce that at the conference. The interesting thing also about that was that their contact at Google was Anurag. Now, I'm not an idiot. I'm not going to pretend that if Crossref Search had launched, it would have been better than Google Scholar, that it would have had more functionality, that it would have done the kinds of things that Google you know, Scholar did. And Anurag, if you talk to him now and said, what happened then? He'd say, well, they were moving too slow. And so we decided to do it on our own. But this thing haunted me because, of course, I'd just been hired to do new initiatives. And their first new initiative, right, had been completely killed, largely by the total lack of trust amongst the members of each other, right? One of the things that people forget about Crossref is that all of the members of Crossref are fiercely competitive in any other situation. And so they'd run this, this, this project as a kind of a, you know, it was a secret project, they were working on it. And then secretly they had two other projects working in the background. It was sort of like a double, a double cross, <laughs> you know, um, a double cross for Crossref. And so almost the first thing that I learned when I joined Crossref was let's not run projects in secret anymore, right? We've got to have these things out in the open. We have got to build trust amongst all of the people who are participating in these things. Um, and, you know, I, I just, I, I want to go back to this thing, right? You know, if Crossref search had launched at that time, it would have had all sorts of restrictions and limitations and weird things that the publishers are obsessed with that Google Scholar did not have. I'm not saying that Crossref search would have been better. But what I think is true is that since that those days, Crossref has evolved to become more open, provides open APIs, provides open metadata. It is far more equitably uh, equitable. It has far broader representation. And in that same period of time, Google Scholar is still pretty unresponsive to the community, still doesn't use the identifiers of the community. It doesn't use DOIs. It doesn't use ORCIDs. It doesn't have an advisory group. And we, as researchers, as a research community, are almost entirely dependent on this service that's being run by an advertising company that has a very bad reputation for shutting things off with like months of notice. And we're still in this situation. So no, you know, Crossref Search would not have been better than Google Scholar at the time, but it might have evolved to be better and certainly more responsive to the community. Might have, we'll never know. But anyway, that experience of, or not, I didn't have the experience, but learning about the experience of Crossref with this project Made, made me make sure that all of the projects and the new initiatives that I ran afterwards 
were known about publicly, that everybody knew what was on the table, what we were doing, and what was happening. And that was one of the first lessons that I learned about developing community, open community infrastructure, was that people have to know what's happening because otherwise what's gonna happen is that they're gonna get paranoid and they're gonna go their own way and try and do something different. And these are some of the projects that I'd worked on over the next few years. In each one of these, I learned other things about what it takes to actually build trust amongst all the constituencies. In a lot of cases, it was no longer just publishers, it was publishers and librarians and researchers and, you know, and institutional administrators and other people that we had to bring on board in order to get them uh, to, 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 to buy into these initiatives and to launch. So we, I, you know, we built up some experience here over periods of time. And eventually, eventually, when I was working with my colleagues, Cameron Nail and Jennifer Lynn, we realized that we'd actually kind of developed a, a list, if you will, of things that we knew you kind of had to do in order to ensure um, that these kinds of infrastructure projects would, would work. And the way we actually discovered this, and I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail here because I think probably Cameron and Jennifer will wanna talk about it later. But um, at one point, the, the time we realized this was Cameron had been on the Crossrift board for a very short period of time, but a very tumultuous period of time. So he got to see the Crossrift board at its most fractious and dealing with some of the you know thorniest issues. And, um, and Jennifer Lynn was involved in a project to try and create a um, uh, alt metrics, an open alt metrics platform at PLOS, right? So they had, they were trying to, they, they both had sort of an interest in, in this kind of infrastructure stuff. And we had an idea for another thing that we wanted to do. And again, I'm not gonna go into details about it. We went off and we wrote a blog post. We wrote this blog post. We didn't intend to write that blog post. We'd actually gone to Brighton on a writing retreat to write another blog post. And what happened was we realized that, wow, um, until we, you know, if, if, we, if we try and launch another infrastructure project and we haven't addressed some of these things you know, and we have to go through the same trust building process again, it's gonna kill us. Let's at least write up some ground rules for what we think it takes to run and operate a open uh, scholarly infrastructure project. Now, as I said, the blog post was the first thing that we did and it was quite a polemic, right? It opened with these lines. Because at the time, remember, we had just seen Mendeley Conatea and all of these systems developed that were free and we used them and we, we thought these were the future and then we were shocked when they got acquired or they got shut down or whatever. And, and, and we were just beginning to see this kind of pattern and we were trying to, you know, and, and we saw that what was happening was that commercial providers were stepping in and they were providing more sort of reliable, predictable infrastructure. And we also saw that what was happening was that this stuff was going to undo a lot of the progress that people had made with open access. That is if the only way that you can, for example, measure how much usage is going on is by using a closed access database, um, you're, gonna, you're, you're still gonna be beholden to the same people. So we developed this set of, of, of principles, right? How can you, how can you ensure that open access infrastructure projects um, remain in control of the community and don't suffer the same fate as a lot of the things that we'd seen that people had tried to build up until then. And we came up with a less list of, I think, sort of three sections. It covers governance, sustainability, and insurance. I think that's what we called it. And it, and it, and it, and it, and it lists something like 16 commitments of things that an open uh, uh, an infrastructure organization would have to commit to. And, and at the time that we wrote this, we didn't know that there was, well, I didn't know. It turns out Jennifer knew, th knew this book long, long ago. But there's this great book, and you could actually probably summarize the points and the references as you have got to give a community voice and you've got to give them the option of exit. It's a balance between voice and exit. If they don't have a say in the governance of the organization and the direction that it goes, 
in the in the priorities that it sets, um, then the thing can go completely off the rail. And the insurance policy is that if if the if the organization does become unresponsive to the community, they have to have a viable way of actually extracting themselves from that infrastructure and taking and, and building an equivalent infrastructure elsewhere that does fulfill their needs and that is responsive to them. So this book is, is really good because it, 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 it's not naive, right? It doesn't just say, well, you've got to balance um, uh, voice and, and exit. Um, it talks about sort of the dangers of organizations where that rely too much on voice, right? Where you give people lots of mechanisms for feedback and people feel like they're being listened to, but nothing actually changes. And then when they realize that nothing has changed and they have been ignoring exit, um, they realize they can't exit either, right? So a lot of organizations can lull people into sort of feeling that things are going okay by giving them sort sort of mechanisms for feedback that they don't actually act act on. And the other extreme is when people have too easy an exit. That is, a, like their first choice is rather than fix the system, they just leave. And the example that he gives. Um, funnily enough, is sort of communities in in the in the in the early days of the United States, where where they always had the option if they didn't like the government of moving further west, right? This was the ultimate option. They could just like pull up stakes, move further west, found a new another community, you know that 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 uh, fulfilled the values that they had, and eventually that, you know, obviously couldn't continue forever. They hit the Pacific, but um, but he gives that as an example. I think another example of a place where you probably have too much of an easy exit is um, if anybody here is familiar with Linux, you've got the Linux kernel, right? Which is pretty solid. Like there's no, there's, there's one kernel, nobody has forked it, nobody has tried to leave this, but there are like a gazillion distributions, right? It's so easy for you to decide, I don't like this distribution of Linux, I'm going to create a new one because I hate the placement of the icons or I don't like system D or whatever it is that your gripe is about Linux, you can go and create your own distribution. So these things, exit and voice are really important. And that's probably how I would summarize a lot of the points that we make in the principles. So we we, we publish these principles and, and then there's this weird period between 2015 where, yeah, they got referred to, people talked about them. I think gratifyingly, we saw the term open scholarly infrastructure become a standard term, and that was good, right? At least people were aware of this and people were talking about it. But a lot of the things that we kind of hoped would happen, right? Like that funders might make, you know, adherence to these principles a mandatory aspect of funding infrastructure projects. Those things did not happen, really. Um, and I was at Crossref at the time, and if you had asked me, like, will Crossref ever adopt these principles, I probably would have said, eh, maybe, but, you know, it's not going to be for five years or so because they'd be too uh, controversial. And then the pandemic happened, and Crossref adopted the principles in uh, 2020. And the impetus for this was that when the pandemic occurred, the board was really concerned and rightly concerned that the effects of the pandemic might really have a big negative effect on a lot of open scholarly infrastructure projects. You know, we didn't know what was going to happen. We didn't understand that publishing is sight of is weirdly, you know, um, counter cyclical in this in this matter, and that actually we thrived and probably, as somebody pointed out, published way more that year because everybody was publishing in preprints and we had DOIs assigned to preprints, so on and so forth. But we didn't know that, and we thought, wow, there's a real risk that that a bunch of infrastructure project could be up against the wall. And our bar, our board said, look, if this happens, you know, we want to be in a position to be able to easily possibly pool our resources and work together um, more efficiently. And what would it take to do that? And our answer after a few years of building uh, infrastructure projects, things like you know, ORCID and, and other stuff, was that at least you know, the bulk of the work was in building trust in the community. 
And that was the most time consuming process. And so our recommendation was, let's see if we can short circuit that by adopting a set of principles that would lay that groundwork so that we wouldn't have to have those, those discussions at the beginning. You know, if something came up, we could say, look, these are the ground rules. Here's what we're going to do. Maybe this, um, you know, maybe we should pool our resources. And, um, and, and the, the board was open to this. And funnily enough, we knew some principles that might apply. The problem was that they were in this polemical blog post. And we knew that the polemical blog post would not go over too well uh, with the board. So there's kind of a difference between the polemical blog post and what we ended up doing, which was extracting the principles from the polemical blog post so that they could just talk about the principles. And when we did that, that was a fairly easy way to, because they looked at them and they said, well, we're doing most of this anyway. We said, yeah. And the other stuff we want to do, and we said, yeah, right? And yes, it took a year you know, of, of talking, but eventually that November, they said, yes, let's adopt these principles. One of the other weird side effects of that was that when I was writing explanations of like why we should do this, I got sick of typing the principles of open scholarly infrastructure. And so I abbreviated POSI and planned to do a search and replace later. And I never got around to that. So almost everything having to do with the development of the website was actually accidental. It was, it was just, I needed a place that I could point the board to and our members to, to say, look, we've adopted these principles. And, um, and I gave it a short name because I was lazy and I didn't want to have to type all of this stuff. And I, and I, and, and I created a website in approximately three hours because I was supposed to write a blog post and be able to point to these things. And as I was doing this, I sent off emails to some of my colleagues, Jennifer and, and Cameron and John Shadaki, and I said, look, we've done this. And John said, hey, we're about to do this too. Maybe we should create a page where, where, where we can have Dryad list its, uh, the fact that it's going to do this as well. And so I said, yeah, that, yeah, I guess that makes sense. Right, fine. We'll you know, create a page and then we'll link, uh, we'll link to these, to these self-evaluations. And we did that. And then more people came. And more people came and more people signed up and more people did these self-evaluations. And currently, like with absolutely no proselytizing from the Posey Posse, we do like alliteration, however, we've got like 18 people who have done these audits and signed up. Um, and that was kind of the birth of the site. It wasn't intentional. It wasn't like a, a, a planned thing. But it's been gratifying to see this happen. These audits, uh, I encourage you to go look at them. They're a combination of, of, of narrative. And then you, they, you know, we set this sort of weird little uh, this precedent where we sort of summarized everything in a table. What, what, of the, what of the commitments have we met? Which ones have we not met? Uh, where are we going with these things? And other people follow that format. So they all follow a pretty much format, but it's, it's purely just because we were imitating each other. It's like there was no plan to this. Nonetheless, this has proven to be a useful thing to point people at. Now I'm gonna take a little break. There's a number there. I'm gonna come back to that later. Over the years of we seeing people, talking to people who were planning on adopting the principles, those who did, some who came to us and talked to us and then disappeared and we don't know what happened to them. Um, I think we've learned a number of things and that's really the kind of the, the thing that I wanna want, want to cover here. Um, the first thing and the sort of the meta issue here is that these are principles, right? And the way, and we have a lot of people who come to us and they interpret them as rules. They say, well, you know, you say that we have to have a contingency fund of a year, but it would probably take us six months to wind down. What, do we really have to have a contingency fund for a year? And the answer is no. The principle is that you should be able to wind down gracefully. And if you can do it in six months, and you can convince your, 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 your community and your stakeholders that you can do it in six months, you can do it in six months, right? The principle, principle of principles is that principles are principles, not rules. And, and most people have got that, but we still, a lot of the things that we see 
the sort of confusion and the, and the, and the concerns about the principles and some of the things have to do with this meta thing, which is that they're interpreting the principles as rules. Um, and you know, if there were a way to make it clearer that the whole point of these things is to, to just ensure that the outcome is possible and not pay attention to necessarily the suggested mechanisms for achieving that outcome, I probably think things would have gone smoother. Second one shouldn't be surprising, and that is creating a contingency fund of a year that allows an organization to operate for a year, even if, they're, if, if they hit the skids and are going to have to go out of business, is a bloody hard thing to do. It took Crossref 23 years to put together that money so that they could guarantee that they could operate for a year if something catastrophic happened and they had to wind down gracefully. This is beyond the means of most small, small organizations. And so one of the things that that I wonder, and I, you know, and I, I look at this because I see people struggling, this is do we have to explore creating some sort of an insurance pool that that small projects can draw on, right? Where the funders can say, here's this insurance pool, you know, if you uh, adhere to the POSI principles and you know, and we look at you and we think that yes, you're doing this thing, then you can you can have the right to draw on this pool until you can actually create a pool of your own. This would probably be a, a huge aid to organizations that wanted to adopt Posey earlier. Um, so can we create an insurance policy? The second thing is that in the principles, we say, we don't want you to lock up data. We don't want you to enclose data. You can't sell data. So what you should probably do is focus on services instead. If you're going to generate revenue, sustainable revenue, focus it on services. And in retrospect, I also think this was probably a naive um, uh, approach because quite frankly, what it's then asking you to do is identify services that are valuable enough that people wanna pay for them, but not valuable enough to be considered essential to the scholarly record and to the rest of the community. And that's kind of a, you know, you just ask people to do almost an impossible thing. And so these building an, some sort of a, a business model based on this is it, on, on, on services, I think is a very difficult thing unless you're doing customization or some other sort of, you know, low margin slog. Um, and so one of the things that I think here is do, do, do we basically need diamond open access infrastructure for if we're particularly if we're going to be supporting diamond to open a open uh, access? And what I mean by this is, is there a mechanism whereby we can support infrastructure through something like endowments or other things that allow people who, again, adhere to the POSI principles, get a grant from a funder who is, you know, put money into the endowment so that they can participate in these infrastructure projects without having to pay for services or uh, without having to lock up data. So these are some things that I think um, it would be worth exploring. The other lesson is that organization, types, uh, organization type matters, but not in the way we tend to think. And let me explain this. Time and time again, you'll say, see people, I've done this, right? I, I know this, I come up, I say, I work for Crossref, we're a nonprofit. People hear the term nonprofit and they're like, he's a good guy, you know? It's all right, he's not out to get us. And the problem with that is that, that nonprofits, um, you know, non and I've actually gone backwards in the, you know, nonprofits is tax status. It's not a, a merit badge of virtue, right? Um, the Heritage Foundation is a 501c3 nonprofit, right? In our, in our community, right, some of the most, what I think open access people would categorize as the most rapacious organizations in, in scholarly publishing are nonprofit organizations. Nonprofit does not indicate that you're going to do good. It's a tax status. I think that there's another thing with nonprofits, and that is that inevitably we think of nonprofits as 501c3s, which is in particularly a US status, uh, tax status code. And 501s have 29 different kinds of 501s. 
Some can lobby, some can't, some are trade organization, uh, associations, some are not, and they all have very different implications. And, um, and the kind of, that, that kind of idea, the 501, doesn't exist in a lot of countries. And the, the countries that you go to where they have maybe a charity equivalent or something like that, they may have very different rules about what charities can do. So for example, in Germany, right, if you set up the equivalent of a nonprofit, one of the things you are prohibited from doing is carrying over a surplus, which means you can never create sustainability because you're never going to be able to build any kind of contingency fund. And so, you know, the issue here is that the organization type really doesn't matter. What matters is that the organization type that you adopt allows you to fulfill the principles, allows you to have representatives from stakeholder community, allows you to build surpluses, allows you to do uh, what you need to do. Um, the other thing I think that we made a mistake with was overemphasis on membership models. And we did this largely because Crossref is a membership organization, Orchid's a membership organization. And, um, and so we were used to this, but membership organizations pose a problem. And that is that there are lots of people who cannot participate in them because membership implies that you have a role in governance. So let's take an example. One of the things that Crossref cannot do is allow members to join from any of the countries or whatever country the United States has decided is not, is 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 on its um, uh, embargo list now, right? So it's um, you know Syria, you can't join Crossref. Cuba, you can't join Crossref. Um, if we were an organization, we'd probably have ways of reaching out. To, if we were not a membership organization, sorry, uh, if Crossref were not a membership organization, not we anymore. Um, they probably would have ways of accommodating people from these countries. But as a membership organization, it would apply that those or that people joining have a role in governance. And that's the thing that prohibits us from accepting people from those countries. So right there, even by adopting a membership organization, what you've done is precluded one of the principles of, 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 uh, of POSI, which is to uh, allow uh, access and to make it global. Right to allow anybody globally to, to, to access the infrastructure. Um, there are other situations, like a lot of universities, for instance, won't allow you to carry over a surplus if you're a group within the thing. So that means founding an infrastructure organization within a university might preclude you from fulfilling some of the POSI requirements. So these are a bunch of things that, like, you know, you really have to think of again, the principle is the thing that you have to focus on. And um, and and adopt the organizational structure that allows you to actually fulfill the principles. The organization itself, structure itself matters, but not, you know, it's not, as I said, it, it's not automatic that if you're a nonprofit, that's that you're safe. Finally, we get to the thing that really, I think is a very dangerous trend. And that is that we're seeing efforts to kind of reframe the conversation around infrastructure. And I understand the motivation. We have lots of people who want to talk about infrastructure, who believe that they're providing infrastructure, and they're introducing terminology that sounds an awful lot like they're talking about open scholarly infrastructure, but they're not, because critically, they're omitting the word open. So what you'll see is people using terms like, we're nonprofit, as a shorthand for, look, we're OK. We're going to be fine. You can trust us. Um, Mission-driven or researcher-driven organization. Uh, shared infrastructure or common infrastructure. None of those things actually say open. It might sound like it, but they're omitting that critical element of openness, the ability to exit, the ability to say you are no longer representing what we need to be able to do and we need to be able to leave. Even things like researcher-led and researcher-focused. Researchers have led us to some pretty weird places. You know, it, it's no guarantee that, the, that, that, that what is good for the researcher is good for research. We know this. We've been spending ages trying to convince researchers to do things that are manifestly good for research, like, you know, um, deposit their data or make their software public or uh, publish open access. Um, so, so we know these things don't do, and I mean, you know, aren't aren't synonymous with 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 good behavior. 
And you even see, like, you know, there, there, there are two reports in particular um, that have come out of Ithaca, where clearly what they're trying to do is broaden the, the sort of the, the, the framing of infrastructure. And if you look at them and you read them, they, they, they mention, like, if you'd search for open infrastructure in these documents, there are zero hits, unless they're citing IOI or something like that. They always consistently use the term shared infrastructure. And this isn't a mistake, right? I mean, they, you can't publish however many is it. I mean, so some of these things are funded by STM, in, who also does not use the phrase open infrastructure, only shared infrastructure, right? And if you go and you look at the various reports, you'll see that like the term infrastructure, you know, in all of the reports that they've done on these subjects, infrastructure occurs 14 times, shared infrastructure 12, community infrastructure one, nimble infrastructure one, open infrastructure zero. So they're talking about infrastructure and I understand that they're trying to broaden the discussion of this, but we can't mistake open, a shared for open. And I'm afraid that we are being sort of lured into thinking that, oh, well, it's shared infrastructure. That sounds good. That's all right. Um, so yes, I mean, if you look at these reports, again, I encourage you, some of them are, some of them are good reports. Um, you just see that there's a very definite um, focus on, on, on this terminology. And, you know, the, the, the thing here is that like nonprofits attack status. It's not a virtue signal. Mission-driven and researcher-driven are only going to be mission-driven and research-driven to the degree that the stakeholders have a say in their governance. Shared infrastructure isn't shared if you're not sharing governance. Um, Researcher-led and researcher-focused organizations, you know, uh, can succumb to the fallacy that what's good for the researcher in their career is good for research. And that's not always the case. So we really have to be very cognizant. We have to be very critical when we're seeing these terms used about what people are actually talking about. Open by any other name is not open. Open is the key. Open is what provides people with exit. Open is what people provi what provides people with the insurance to be able to leave. And this is the thing that really concerns me. I think the place where we're seeing this really happen is when we're talking about tools for ensuring research integrity. Now, when Cameron and Jennifer and I started looking at, at this problem, we could see a clear trend at the time, which was that, that, that publishers were pivoting, particularly subscription-based publishers, were pivoting from, um, from publication to information services, and particularly research evaluation services. And we thought this was a threat because if the only way to evaluate research, whether it's open or not, is through closed systems, this is going to really put the research community at, in, in a bad situation. And it's only, until, it's only recently that with things like the Barcelona Declaration that we're actually addressing this thing that has crept in and taken over the scholarly community, which is that a lot of the tools that we use to evaluate research are closed, and we can't get access to the data or understand what's going on. I think a similar thing is now happening with research integrity tools. We need research integrity tools, but the problem is that what's happening is that we're building suites of research integrity tools that are closed, that are expensive, that only a subset of publishers can access. And we're seeing the message that, message that if you are not using these research integrity tools, then we might wanna doubt the research that's coming out of your system. We really have to protect this mechanism. If people are going to have access to research integrity tools, it's got to be equitable access. And at the moment, this isn't happening. So I think this is probably the new battleground uh, for uh, research uh, integrity. So the final sort of observation here um, is an observation uh, my former colleague, uh, Martin Eve, made uh, about pos POSI which is that stakeholders don't seem to be taking enough initiative in actually reviewing the self-audits that the POSI adopters are doing. 
And without that critical scrutiny, and notice that I'm just saying stakeholder scrutiny, I'm not talking about audits, I'm not talking about anything formal. I'm talking about the community looking at these audits, evaluating them, saying, do these things make sense to me? You know, are they missing something? Is there some loophole that they haven't that they haven't seen? I'm not implying that any of the people who have done the Posey self audits are lying or misrepresenting things, but every organization has a level of myopia, of of self blindness, and it really takes a community to look at some of these things and try and understand what they mean. Let me give you an example, right? Um, that applies to both uh, data site and to Crossref. DataCite and Crossref are DOI registration agencies. And they're both people, both organizations that have done self audits and endorsed the POSI principles. But both organizations are also entirely dependent on the DOI foundation. And the DOI foundation is dependent on, um, on CNRI, which runs the handle system. They haven't endorsed POSI. So we've, you know, they're, you know, in a case like that, you've got turtles all the way down. You have to actually look at the, the implications of these things. And, um, and, and, and really, I think the community is in, uh, in the best position uh, uh, to do this. Um, so one of the things that we're, you know, the real call here, I think, is that we need the community to be a lot more critical of the language that people are using when they're describing infrastructure. Yes, things can be researcher led, they can be shared, they can be what, but if the word open is missing, this should start raising eyebrows. This should start causing concern. Um, and then finally, we need people to actually look at the organizations that have endorsed these and say, okay, do these things make sense? Um, now I put up a number earlier, 877. That's the number of days it's been since Crossref has issued an update on its POSI audit. Now, I can tell you that, that, they, that they probably have good news on some fronts. It's, it's not, I'm not angry that Crossref hasn't done this. What I, what I worry about is that the community hasn't noticed, that they haven't called them on this. Crossref's not the only one. There are other people there who haven't updated their audits. And if that happens, if we just take these audits, these endorsements of Posey, and say, ah, we're safe. They signed this. It's OK. Posey isn't going to work. There's got to be some interactivity there. There's got to be some feedback. There's got to be some going back and forth. So I'm a minute overhead. I mean, over. Um, and um, But thankfully, I'm also um, at the end.